Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear your testimony about how God is using Destiny in your life. You can visit our website at destinychurchjacksonville.com and click on the testimony link. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can also do so online. Now, get ready to receive an amazing word from the Lord. Everyone, Come on, can we just take a few more seconds and thank God for his goodness. Thank him for his mercy. Thank him for his love. Thank him that he gives us what we don't deserve. Come on, thank him that we have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Yeah, God is good. And I'm so grateful. I see what you guys did right there. Y'all are ready for that, huh? And we'll do that one more time. God is good. That's old school. That's old school. Y'all been in church for a long time. <laughs> and uh, if you are here today and you are our guest, I just want to join in and just say, man, we are so glad to have you this morning. Come on, church. Can we welcome our guests that are here? We know that you could have been doing a lot of things. You could have been getting ready for your Super Bowl party. I saw some old Patriot jerseys in here. Rob, I'm going to be praying for you, man. <laughs> oh, God's good, man. And uh, hey, I'll tell you what. Uh, let us also, can we welcome our online audience? I think I shared this with you uh, a couple weeks ago. We've had, over the last seven years, over a quarter million downloads in our messages. and set, that's, that's crazy. That's crazy. So we, we welcome you online, whether you're on the website, whether you're on the podcast, our YouTube channel. Uh, we're just uh, glad to have you guys here worshiping with us. And if you are just joining us, over the last several weeks, we've been talking about vision. And we decided that when we uh, wanted to talk about vision, we knew that we were going to have to make it into a series because this particular topic is, is so multifaceted and there's so much to say about it. And it's been my hope and my prayer that throughout this series that you would grab hold of the vision that God has destined for your life. Now, if you recall, we talked about why vision was so important in week one. And how that a person without a vision is a person without a future. And a person without a future will always return to their past. And by the way, I just feel prompted to say this right now. If there's someone that's here this morning, and I believe that there are, that you believe that your best days are behind you, I just want to remind you of something. God saves the best for last. Now, you may not see how that's possible, but that's okay. You don't have to see it to believe it. Listen, the world says that seeing is believing, but in the kingdom of God, believing is seeing. I'm talking about us seeing through the lens of faith, trusting in the Lord with all of our heart and not leaning on our own understanding and trying to figure out why or how things are going to work out. You know, I've had a lot of people who, who have kind of challenged me when I sort of challenged them to keep believing for, for big things. I said, but Chris, what do you do when you've been believing and believing for something for years and still nothing has happened? But can I just ask for a moment of honesty and ask who, who's here that there, there's been some things that, that, that you are believing for that haven't happened? Or maybe at one point in your life, you were at a place where you were believing for something and it seemed like it never would come about. Well, would you just raise your hand? Okay, so like your pastor's hands up, right? Because there are things that I've been praying about that I've not seen happen yet in my life. But if there's any one thing that I've learned in scripture, it's that we're not to give up faith and hope that we're never to throw in the towel and call it quits. In the book of Habakkuk chapter two and verse three, it says, for still the vision is, waits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, I love this. It says, it will not lie. You see, God's not a man that he should lie, so if he spoke something to your heart, God's gonna bring it about in his timing. The scripture goes on to say, if it seems slow, wait for it. Come on, say wait for it. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. How many of you found that most of life is about us waiting? You see, what, what I didn't understand when I was younger was that there is actually purpose. There's meaning uh, during this time of waiting. 
And if it seems like that there's something that's delayed in your life, it isn't because God's busy. It's not like taking a number at the DMV and he'll get back to you whenever he can. See, I found that delayment often means development. When God hasn't brought about something that he's spoken to your life, that's probably because there's something that he's working out in your life or in the lives of those around you. And I say in the lives of those around you because our destiny is rooted and planted in the community that God has placed in our lives. And so as we wrap up this series on vision, I just want to remind you that vision isn't just something that we talk about at the beginning of the year. And it's not something that we should just reduce down to a set of resolutions with the hopes that we'll be able to do them. Because you see, vision, it shapes every single aspect of our lives. Because vision is the lens by which we interpret the things that happen to us. It determines the way that we view people. And it even shapes our concept of God. But watch this. Here's what I really want you to catch this morning. Vision doesn't happen on accident. Vision happens on purpose. I shared this during week one, but I think that it's worth sharing again. It's direction, not intention, that determines our destination. And I hope that that this series has has caused you to begin to, to dream again, but even more, to begin to take steps toward your destiny. Well, as I said, this is going to be the last message of this series, and I've enjoyed having my wife tag team along with me in this this series and talking about vision. And she's going to come up here uh, after I'm done sharing and share a little bit with you. But first, I want you guys to to get this into your spirit. Now, just because I'm a big believer that repetition is the best teacher, I I want to ask you to repeat these words after me. Say Christ, Christ. community, Community. and cause. cause. Now, while these words are the summation of the vision of Destiny Church, what I also believe is that this is the progression in which God works in our lives. You see, it's Christ first, because without Christ being first, then we're building on a foundation that won't last. In the book of Isaiah 40 and verse eight, it says it this way, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You see, a me first foundation A job first foundation, a money first foundation, or anything else that we put first won't be able to stand against the trials and the difficulties of life. Now, for the last two weeks, we talked about community and the necessity for it in our our walk with God and how that God never intended for us to be an island unto ourselves, And that all throughout scripture, we get a clear picture of what relationships uh, should look like. But church, what I want you to consider is the progression of these three words that we've been talking about throughout the series, Christ community cause, because the progression is significant. And here's what I mean. You see, everything flows from what we put first. And by the way, if you want to know what you're putting first, You can just trace the breadcrumb trails of uh, your time and your energy and your resources. See, I can tell you what's most important to you by looking at your checkbook and your calendar. It's quiet all of a sudden. And I mention this because watch this, church. I think that oftentimes we recite a Sunday school answer because we know what we should be saying without actually investigating to see if there's any fruit or any proof that gives credence to what we say that we believe. Again, it's still quiet. But watch this, church. This is what we need to be doing because the scripture says to examine yourselves, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. But the progression of Christ's community cause, it comes in this and the net. What we put first in our life will develop and it will determine the community that we experience. Maybe you've heard the old saying before, birds of a feather flock together. Which, by the way, the friends that we surround ourselves with will often be an indicator of what we are putting first in our lives. But we've got to have Christ first 
in order for us to experience community in the way that God intended. You see, if we put Christ first, and then we surround ourselves with community, then the natural progression is to then be united in a cause, which is what Jody and I want to talk to you about this morning, living for a cause. Now, here's the interesting thing about a cause. Most people don't start out with a cause. It's simply the byproduct of what they've put first in their lives and the community in with which they've surrounded themselves. Are you hearing me this morning? Because you see, what's important to me and what's important to those around me constructs a, constructs a uh, plan of action, be it intentional or unintentional. And those actions, they end up becoming the story of our lives. They become our cause. Now, I got a confession to make. This may sound weird to some of you, but I like to read the dictionary. As a matter of fact, I have several dictionary apps, and I'm kind of addicted to the word of the day. Um, can, can anyone relate with my weird addiction? And you'd be brave enough to say it. Great, two people um, leave me. Being not the only weird person in the room, thank you for raising your hand. But I'm not sure where this weird addiction comes from, by the way. Um, I, I think that it's because I believe that words play an important role in communication, and communication plays a vital role in relationships. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm just telling myself that to try to make up for my weird addiction uh, and believe that it has purpose. But all that to say, I want to give you uh, the definition of cause according to Noah Webster. Cause is defined as a goal to which an individual or a party upholds and works for. Now, can I just tell you that when I first read that definition, I wrote in my notes that everyone needs a cause. But then you know what? I went back and I actually scratched it out because it dawned on me. I thought, you know what? Everyone actually has a cause. I mean, you and I are working toward some kind of goal. You may not be aware of that goal, but all of our lives are heading somewhere. If I can just say it like this, the wind of life is always blowing. Now, you can let it blow you wherever it wills, or you can set your sail and be intentional about where you're going. Are you following with me, church? Amen. See, too many people, they just drift through life in hopes of them landing at the right place. You know what it kind of reminds me of? We had an activity whenever I was in elementary school where we would take a postcard, we would write our name on the postcard, and then the phone number of the school, and we would tie it onto a string, which we would then tie onto a helium balloon, and our whole class would go out, and we would let our balloons go. Did anybody else ever do this? And uh, we were kind of weird in Kentucky, but um, it would go out, and we would see whose would go the furthest, because they would call back in. We'd say, hey, call this number, and we'd find out where they're at, and then we would win a prize for whoever had the furthest, you know, balloon, um, which is fine when you're playing a child's game. But that isn't fine when we're talking about life. You see, we've got to identify and pursue the cause that God has called us to. We've got to press on toward the goal so that we can win the prize, as the Apostle Paul says. So let me take you to a place in Scripture, which is actually the place where the Holy Spirit first highlighted the word cause as part of our three C's, Christ community cause. And it's found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now Jesse had sent out his son David to check on his brothers who were at war with the Philistines. And when David had arrived, he noticed that the Israelite army was being taunted by this Philistine warrior whose name was Goliath. He was a giant of a man and he had caused the army of Israel to become paralyzed with fear. And so David asked the question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the uh, army of the living God? And I'm sure that there was probably also an underlying question that he didn't ask, that question being, and why isn't anyone doing anything about it? And so his oldest brother, uh, Eliab, got angry and he, he lashed out at David, questioning his heart and his, his motives. But then David responded to Eliab's 
uh, criticism by this one question. He asked, is there not a cause? Now, I can't help but wonder, could the same reason that held the Israelites back from not engaging in this cause be the same reason that many Christians are held back today? Now, scholars may give you several reasons as to why the Israelites didn't take action against Goliath, but I think the reason's pretty clear. They were overcome with fear. They didn't engage in battle because they didn't think that they could win. Now, church, this is why cause is the last of our three C's, because it takes having a Christ-first life first, and then it takes having a community to see what we can't see on our own and to remind us that whenever we see something that seems too big for us, that it's not too big for God. And it also takes a community to remind us that there are some causes worth fighting for, like the cause in the video that got put up on the screen today, and I won't apologize for it. There comes a place where we have to quit trying to be politically correct and being biblically correct and stand up for something, church, and have a spiritual backbone. Yeah. You know, yesterday, I was thinking about what it meant to serve the causes of Christ. And as I was thinking about it, I couldn't help but to be um, have my mind go into thinking about what the church looked like, the early church looked like, because I think that in, in so many ways we, we've kind of uh, digressed and fallen away from that. And so uh, I went back just to read it for myself, honestly, um, and, but then it ministered to me so much that I thought, man, I've got, I've got to share this with the church, and I, I pray that, that, it, that it stirs you in the same way that it, that it stirs me. But it, it's probably a familiar portion of Scripture to many of you that have been in church for some time, but it's Acts chapter 2. In 42 through 47. And the scripture says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. See, I think we can't even get past the first three words to where we already see the breakdown within the church because we don't have much devotion anymore. I said we don't have much devotion anymore. If it's too cold outside, then we just stay at home, don't even come to church. I had a friend of mine who is in Niger right now. He'll be here in a month. He'll be sharing with us. But um, he showed a picture of uh, some guys, maybe a group of 25, uh, just out, out on a ditch on the side of the street. And they were all on their knees on the ground and rocks. And, and the pastor had his Bible, Bible open and was, was just teaching them. I thought, wow. Wow, what, what, what a contrast to the church here. But they devoted themselves. And I believe that God's calling us to high, higher levels of devotion, church, to higher levels of commitment. I think it's time for us. I'm not trying to just call you out. I'm trying to call you up. Are you hearing me this morning? I'm not throwing out condemnation. I'm saying it's time for us to rise up. Okay, we messed up. Now let's get it right. Amen? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and of the prayers. And all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. And they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Friends, this is what the church is supposed to look like. Hey, sign me up, amen? I said, sign me up. Listen, I, I don't wanna just read about this. I want to experience this. You know, this past week, I did something that I had never done before. I got away for an extended period of time just to get alone and turn the phone off and, 
And I went and rented a room at a hotel and just got alone to pray and put the little sign out front. And uh, man, it was such an awesome time. As a matter of fact, I just wanna encourage you to, man, build those times in your life. I, I, I know that it means uh, there's gonna be something you're gonna have to say no to because to say yes to one thing means to say no to another, right? But it's just something that, man, you need to build into your life. I, I, I can't believe that I've not done that more often. Uh, I've had plenty of times where I've gotten away with my wife, but you know, th- there's something about when it's just us and God and we get alone and we say, okay, Lord, here am I. And man, he'll, he'll meet with you. He'll meet with you. And, and so uh, in, in this place of prayer and just seeking God for the direction for the church in 2019, because man, we have so much coming. If y'all only knew, there's so much coming in 2019. We better be ready. And um, I'll tell you, uh, this year, I, I was praying about God as, as we're going this certain direction um, would you just kind of begin to give me a word for, for 2019? And I've shared this with my staff that I felt like this, the Lord said that this is the year of growth. Uh, and, and that, I think that does mean numerically, what, but I think even more than that, I think that it's going to uh, mean growth in, in maturity, that we're going to be growing in, in the things of Christ. And that's always been my heart for, for this church. It's not just so that we can say, how many are you running? right? Oh, yeah, we broke 400 today. No, that, no. I, you know, I want to be able to put a, a thermometer in our mouths and say that we're running hot. That's what we're running. Amen? <laughs> and so as I, I was praying um, for, for this year, God just began to really uh, download into my heart just the direction that we're going for this year. And I just want you to know that every series that I'm going to preach in 2019 is going to be pointing back to what we just read in Acts chapter 2. Every series that, 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 uh, that I'm going to share with you is going to be causing us to become those people that we just uh, read about, to be the church as I believe God has intended for it to be. Church, we've got one shot at this thing called life. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste one more second living for any other purpose other than the purpose which God has purposed. Amen? Listen, I want to share a couple more thoughts with you, and I'm going to invite my wife to come up. And So if the preaching hasn't been good so far, don't worry, the second half's going to be better. So the first thought is this. When we talk about serving the causes of Christ, you can't even talk about it without saying the word serve. Because you see, cause goes hand in hand with serving. And Jesus both taught and demonstrated this truth. He couldn't have made it any clearer when he said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for the many. You see, our lives reflect that of our Savior in the brightest way when we serve. We should be looking to serve church at every possible turn. You know, there was one place in the scripture where Jesus said to the disciples that the greatest in the kingdom of God would be the servant of all. What was Jesus saying? He says, hey, guys, if you want to be great, then serve. But I want to quickly address why I believe that, that, that many in the church don't serve. Now, this isn't the only reason, but, but it's a big one. It's because people often make their choice to serve based on how they feel. But I want you to catch this. Actions of love lead to feelings of love, not the other way around. You see, love grows when people serve. But too many times we make the mistake of refraining from from serving simply because we don't feel like it. But can I just tell you that I can't think, and I, and I thought about it, I can't think of one single instance of when I've served someone and regretted it. Now, there were plenty of times that I didn't feel like serving. But after serving, I've never regretted it. And guess what? There were those who uh, took it for granted. Those, well, there were those that uh, took advantage of it. But even still, I never regretted serving. You know, one of the reasons that I've never regretted serving is that because through serving, God did something in my heart. You see, here I thought I was doing something for someone, for God. But actually what was ended up happening was God was doing something in my life. And while we're talking about it, can I just also say that oftentimes 
God may call you to serve in a capacity or to serve someone that you don't really want to. Oh, yeah, you will. And can I just tell you, for this, is my, my little, this is my testimony, is that one of the greatest heart transformations that I've ever had in my entire life was when God called me to serve someone that I really, really didn't like. Don't worry, it's none of you in here because I like all of you, but <laughs> most of you. I'm just kidding. God put on my heart, first of all, just to start praying for that person, which, by the way, that is a form of serving, by praying for them. I believe it is. It takes your time and your energy if you're really praying. But God called me to begin to start praying for that person. And then God called me to start uh, serving him in other ways, like just to begin to encourage this guy when I would see him. And then even offer myself to be able to help him with, with various tasks. And church, this resulted in God doing a transformative work in my heart. You see, we love those in whom we serve. Some of you think that you may not like kids, but if you just spent a couple of Sunday mornings back there serving the infants and the toddlers in the nursery, you'd be ruined. I had a, a good friend of mine in New Mexico who actually, how many, how many Florida fans? Any Florida fans in here? He, he uh, was a... Um, a diver. He had a scholarship many years ago uh, to Florida. And so he, he was a man's man, a athlete. I mean, still at, at 60 years old, can run a marathon like, like it's nothing. And one Sunday morning, he responded to a call to help because there was a need in the nursery. And he didn't want to. I've heard him tell this testimony so many times. And he said but that, that God dealt with his heart and said, you know what? Why can't you go out there and help? What makes you think you can because you're a man, I think we've got some, some messed up roles whenever it comes to church and thinking that men can't do some things that women can do, and we think that women can't do some things that men can do, and I'm going to preach on that and get some religious devils out of here one of these days, because God has called us all as Jew and Gentile, as male or female. We are all one in Christ. Hello? Getting on my soapbox there. But listen. My buddy Bob, he signed up, and he went in, and, or let me say it this way, Bob Pop, because that's what the kids call him. He's ruined. Absolutely. Matter of fact, to this day, and that's been years ago, he still serves in the children's ministry. You can't keep that guy from going back there every week. See, church, I'll tell you what I've learned that only experience can teach. There's a joy that's found through serving that you can't find anywhere else. You say, Pastor, but I don't feel like I'm gifted in any area. Where can I serve? Well, if you can make coffee, I know where you can serve. If you can smile and say, good morning, it's great to see you, I know where you can serve. If you can help set up signs, I know where you can serve. If you can help lift boxes and move them around, I know where you can serve. Listen, every person has something that he or she can serve others with. 1 right. Peter 4.10 says it this way. It says, as each has received a gift. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, you have a gift. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Church, this is the one another that we talked about whenever we talked about community. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. See, church, our service to God is considered stewardship to God. Now, please hear what I'm saying this morning. God has a place for each and every one of us to serve. And that place is a place of great significance. And I hope you hear me this morning because I believe that there are a lot of people who they don't serve in a particular area because they think that it might not be that significant. Well, in the world's eyes, it might not be that significant, but can I just tell you that God doesn't see things the way that the world sees them. I mean, if you don't believe that, then, then go read about the widow's mind. But let me just uh, end my portion of today's message by saying what I feel so strongly, and that is that we will never walk in the fullness of our destiny until we serve others. 
Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. That means just to, whatever gift God's given it, just to use it for ourselves. But through love, serve one another. Amen? Guys, welcome my beautiful wife as she comes up and share with you all. Okay. So I have thoroughly enjoyed teaching this series with my husband. But if I am being honest, I'm actually also looking forward to a break. Because I'll tell you what, every time I speak, I am, every time I am just reminded of how gifted my husband is. Because after three weeks, like, I feel like I got nothing else. Like, I feel like I'm done. And so I don't know how he does it week after week. We are blessed in your gifting. So I want to tell you, thank you for that. <laughs> so since we're talking about cause today, I thought it would be the perfect time to tell you that at the end of the month, we are going to have a serve team launch. It's going to be a lot like our community group launch in that you are going to get to shop our teams. There's going to be different tables for each one. It's going to be fun, exciting. We're going to have snacks. And today, we hope to inspire you to join one of them. We hope to inspire you. But even more than that, we hope to explain to you why it is so very, very important that you are serving in some capacity in the church and outside of the church. Because see, here's the thing. It's more than just a good idea. It is part of who you were created to be. So I brought this illustration last week. It was kind of like the subtle illustration of community. But I hope to use it this week to paint two pictures for you. Two separate representations that are interconnected and fueled by the same sources. I don't know about you, but for me, intangible concepts, they seem to like kind of grab on in my mind a little better when I give them a tangible visual. And so I'm hoping to do that for you guys today. And so my first attempt is this. If you have come to Destiny today, and maybe you like the worship or you like the messages or something else that we have to offer, but yet you have not connected in our community or engaged in our causes, you have only just come into the foyer. Now, like I said last week, the foyer is a good place to be. It's warm inside, right? You're safe from the weather. You're protected from harm. You're enjoying the environment. But connecting in community is like coming into the living room. That's where we get to know each other. That's where we, we talk through things. That's where we encourage. That's where we pray. That's where we laugh. That's where we cry. Well, engaging in our causes is like coming into the kitchen. So I don't know if it is the same at your house as it is in mine, but a lot of life happens around my table. I cook a lot of meals around that table, and I, I have a really big table. When we left New Mexico, I told my husband that I wanted something to remind me of it, and I had always wanted a really big table, so I have a 460-pound Mexican mesquite table. And I cook a lot of meals that people eat around that table, and it takes a lot of work. And I just get an amen for everyone that cooks in their kitchen. Those meals do not magically appear, do they? No, it takes planning. It takes preparation. Well, also at that table, my girls and I, we have our Bible lesson there. And also at that table, our church staff works. And it's also where we have our team meetings. And it is also the place that Destiny had its very first meeting. So if you like who we are as a church, it's because of what happens around the table. The causes of Christ are what fuel us. They are what we talk about. They are what we plan for. They are what we work toward. They are what fuel us. See, but this isn't just the story of destiny. I want to explain to you today why this is also your story. See, in Ephesians 2, 19, it says this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too, you too, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. See, this is where my second representation comes in. It's not just about coming to a nice church deciding to stay, deciding to commit. This is your story also, because this is also what God is building in us, us as individuals, because we were created with Christ's community causing it into our DNA. It's part of who we are. It cannot be separated. See, we too are a house that God is building, and in that house is also a table. See, Psalm 23 says uh, of the Lord, he says that he's prepared a table before us, 
and the presence of our enemies. And that table, it's a representation of everything that he has to offer us. It's all the promises of his word. It's the power of his resurrection. It's the gifts of his sonship and all the other blessings. It's, it's all of those things. And Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. See, there isn't just a table set before you. He is there at the table. He is there at the, at the table. And so as individuals, we are who we are because of what happens at the table, because of what happens in his presence. And so I just want to ask this question. When was the last time that you showed up in his presence alone with him and you stayed long enough to get the peace that you needed? When was the last time that you showed up and you stayed long enough to get the strength that you needed? That you walked away with everything that you needed because everything you need is at the table. But we have to show up. And I get it because I too, I have pushed snooze so many times that I was rushing. But the hard truth is there is no fast food at this table. We have to stay there long enough to take up what he has to offer. And it's like a buffet set before us, flavored just for us. Flavored just for us, individually. But we need to stay long enough to get it. And I understand. I am a wife. I am raising three children. I homeschool. I carpool. I'm administrating a church. I'm managing a home. And sometimes I'm cooking three meals a day on top of it. But you know what the truth is? There's time. Because we make time for what's most important. And we have got to make time for this. We've got to make time for it. And though we dine in the presence of our enemies, we are not seated at their level. Because Ephesians 2, 6 says, God has seated us with him in the heavenly realms. See, we get a vantage point above it all. And that is where our victory is. Revelations 4 tells us that there is worship going on around the throne all the time, without ceasing, even now. That is the atmosphere in the heavenly realms. And that should be our atmosphere. In Romans 2, 1, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters... And view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. See, worship is part of our makeup. That word has two meanings. It's part of our DNA, but it's also something we put on. See, worship, guys, listen to this. Worship is nothing if not everything. It is nothing if it's not everything. So C.S. Lewis said it so well in this quote. He said, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on, and you knew that those jobs needed doing, so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably, and he does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. He's throwing out a wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. And he intends to come and live in it himself. See, God is building something beautiful here at Destiny, but he's also building something beautiful inside of you. And he is a master architect, and his designs are always good, and they're always right. And we can trust him. And there is room in you for community, and there is a room in you for serving. And some of you, there's a whole wing because you were meant to lead. And, you know, maybe, maybe you have wholeheartedly been inhabiting those for many, many years. And maybe there's some people in this room, maybe they're new to you. Regardless, God intends for every room inside of you to be fully renovated and fully occupied because that's what he's doing inside of us. He is building a home, and he means for his spirit to come and dwell in every room, every room, every moment we were created to serve. It is our living worship. It is our destiny. And I will tell you what. If you are not serving, you are always going to find yourself defeated. You're going to find yourself dissatisfied and you're going to find yourself lethargic because we were created to serve. Because takers are never satisfied, but givers, they find a fulfillment that can't be manufactured. 
We were created in the image of our Lord and Savior, and he came to serve, not to be served. And see, here's the thing. In the church, we should be trying to outdo each other in service, but you know what we spend most of our time doing? Trying to outdo each other in performance. We want to be seen more than we want to serve. We want to be first more than we want to help others advance. And we want to increase when we should be decreasing. See, he is enlarging our inner capacity to make more room for his plans and his, his purposes. And I think, guys, I think deep in my spirit that God is raising up a people in this place that are ready to make the enemy regret the day that he came after us. I know that I am. I know that I am. See, we know that the enemy's days are numbers, but numbered, but ours are counted in Christ. See, I am after everything that belongs to my God, and I will not relent. And we as a church cannot relent because there is too much at stake. There is too much at stake. See, this is, this is my story. This is Destiny's story. But this is also your story because we are the church that he is building. We are the church that he's building, and we are stronger together. We can do more together, and we must do more together. See, I believe that God is calling us up. He is calling us to build up a house that is standing strong on a solid foundation. And I believe that he's calling us out. I believe that he's calling us to be different. He's calling us to be separate. He's calling us to be like him. And I believe that he's calling us in. I believe that he's calling us into the plans and the purposes of his kingdom. And I believe that he's calling us together to be unified and to be single-minded in our pursuit. And you know what? If we respond, I see a church that is strong and beautiful. I see a people that are humble but confident and I see a movement, guys. I see a movement coming that is selfless but powerful. I see us bringing the kingdom of God here to earth every day, in every moment, in every decision, in every stand that we take, in every time that we put our hand to the plow, in every encouragement that we give. I see a giant rising up and taking her place. I see it. I see it one child at a time. I see it one marriage at a time, one conversion at a time, one freedom at a time. I see us moving mountains every day, every day. I see us victorious. And I see us taking this good news to the world. That's the church I wanna to belong to, people you are that church. You are that church. It is time that we go and we be that church. Will you stand with me? We're going to declare this song again.